Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of the Lord's Sworn Order podcast. We are coming to you from freezing cold Colorado. Uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Yule. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah. If you celebrate happy, happy New Year. Happy it. Happy <laughs> Solstice. Happy there's a new Star Wars out. Happy there's a new Star Wars out. <laughs> We really hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. We loved it. We also marathoned all six of the originals um, ahead of going to see it. And Brianna saw all of them for the first time. She's she's except, grinning right now. She has a not. really adorable <laughs> grin on her face. <laughs> so we were under the impression that Brianna had not seen these before. As I was too. Yeah, she, Brianna she, was under the impression. She told us, yeah, she told us ahead of time that she had like not seen any of the Star Wars movies before. And we start watching them, and she's like, oh, yeah, this is the one with the little bear guys. Oh, yeah, this is the one with the, you know, the walker, the big metal walkers. It's like, oh, yeah, Star Wars with the Jedi and the Force and Luke Skywalker. Yeah, I've seen this. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, the only part you didn't remember was that it was called this, Star is Wars. Is this the movie where the Death Star is destroyed <laughs> <laughs> by a rebel alliance seeking to topple oh, yeah, the Galactic Empire? This well... Is, this is the one where the Trade Federation is blockading Naboo and the Chancellor has an elaborate plan to take out. No. <laughs> to clarify, I didn't grow up with Star Wars. I didn't grow up with any comics. I grew up around horses and me being alone in my room drawing because I was always in trouble for something. So I really didn't grow up with all the stuff like everyone did. And I did see this spoof movie off of Star Wars, and I think that's where some of my knowledge came from. But other than that... Um, I, I must have seen it with a friend at some point, and that was it. So yeah, so, yeah. we refreshed Brianna's memory, and um, <laughs> by way of trial by fire, we we really really wanted to know what she thought of it because she might be the only person. Well, we thought she might be the only person in America left who hadn't seen all of them, but this is just her first opportunity to give us her impressions. <laughs> so to our questions, Brianna, who was your favorite character? Now that you have seen them. For um, real, I would. Uh, it's between uh, Yoda and Chewbacca. Honestly, I like nice. I, good answer. I like, awesome, um, good answer. Yoda's wisdom and Chewbacca just reminds me of our our dog Casey. It just makes me laugh every time. So <laughs> our dog Casey, who was terrified when we put our own little Bolero on, She's like, what is happening? <laughs> True story. My LinkedIn profile under foreign languages it says English, uh, native or bilingual proficiency. German limited working proficiency, Swedish limited working proficiency, Shriwook uh, native or bilingual proficiency. <laughs> that has been on my actual LinkedIn profile for as long as I've had a LinkedIn profile. Shriwook. <laughs> Shriwook, so, the language of the Wookiees. My question is Puppet Yoda? <laughs> Or flying oh, potato CG I know, Yoda? I know there's only one answer to this one. No, yeah. actually, there's, there's not. There are two answers. I appreciate both sides. <laughs> because. So I, puppet Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the CG for, the see it's a more modern movie and that's why I like it. But then I also like the older fashioned, you know, you have to imagine, you know, him being real, that type of thing. So I like both. Um, I think with the effects of the lightsabers, obviously I prefer the CG. Well, I think uh, they were always CG. I they know, just but got more cleaner, cleaner in looking in the newer ones. But yeah. um, I honestly have, I don't have a preference with Yoda. I like both. That's fair. Which design team would you have liked to be on? For this world, um, I would love to be in the costume design. Um, the techie design with the spaceships is not my thing. I'm more of a Lord of the Rings type of landscape designer if I were to do anything. Which, Star Wars has a lot of that. Which like, it has a lot for of For a sci-fi series, it looks a lot like a fantasy. But if I was on that style. team, I'd be forced to do it anyway. So yeah. I, I think I would um, enjoy doing the costumes more um, and just being a seamstress. Actually, I really, I really considered doing that once I saw Lord of the Rings and um, trying to get myself out there, but I decided not to do it. <coughs> um, which... Uh, which planet, which race would you have wanted to design? Or would you have, like, modified as you were watching it? I don't know if I can give you a planet or race. Um, 
If anything, I would like to see more unique planets, and or something that you've ne we we would not really recognize as such. But um, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that. How about um, so? Okay, so you've seen all of them. You've seen the originals. You've seen the prequels, and we all went to see the new one, of course. Which one is your favorite? <laughs> I don't know if I could pick a favorite, honestly. I do like the originals. Um, the I, I like things about all of them. The more modern ones, the prequels, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm a very <clears throat> visual person, so I really like a lot of aspects from those movies, but obviously the how they were written, they were not great. Um, I do like... <laughs> I forgot just how bad they were. How they, were, how they were written, they were not great. <laughs> Brianna's review of the prequels. That is, that is about all honest, you need to know. To be honest with you, watching the prequels again actually like knocked some of the nostalgia I would had for them yep. when I would found ways to enjoy them as a well, younger adult. And, and I'm one of those people, like, I don't hate the prequels. I, I, don't hate them. I, I like the originals better, but I, I don't hate the prequels. Um, I think they could have been done much better, and it was definitely a huge missed opportunity that they weren't done better, but I can watch them. I don't think they ruined Star Wars. Um, I don't think they ruined Star Wars. No, I think a, a little a little piece of me dies every time someone says something. <laughs> I mean, great action, and by and large, when they do stuff, it's fun to watch, but every time someone opens their mouth, I'm just like, oh. You know, stuff starts no. to happen, and then Jar Jar steps and shit, and it's like, uh, uh. I think I think you could have, you could have, Recast Anakin, got rid of Jar Jar Binks, and got rid of or completely redone all the love scenes in Episode Two, and they would have the, the prequels would be pretty good movies. Yeah, I think yeah. I feel like uh, um, feel about them as though the Hobbit movies. Like a lot of folks think they were way too long. They um, <laughs> certain uh, parts are not. A lot of folks accurately think they were way yeah. too long. I have no opinion on it, but I love the visual aspect to it and the yeah. art behind it and that's how i feel about the prequel prequels. that's fair so i remember i remember spending like hours pouring over everything when the prequels came out and i didn't i didn't particularly like the movies i don't think i even saw episode three you know until years later but i loved like getting to revisit all that stuff and having new information and i loved the eu surrounding the prequels the prequels is movies i could on it take them or leave them uh, eh. but <clears throat> the jedi apprentice young adult books yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. You know the the choose your own adventure stuff that came out. If yeah. You remember that we used to play. Yeah, it was almost sports. like a pseudo tabletop RPG. Yeah. yeah. Th there were there were a lot of really good ex EU stuff that came around surrounding the prequels that I thought was just absolutely top shelf. I mean, like I just read, a, for example, I just read a novel set not long after Revenge of the Sith entitled Kenobi about a span of Obi Wan's exile on Tatooine that is. Not just one of the finest Star Wars novels I've ever read. It's it's frankly one of the finer novels I've ever read. So some good stuff came from it. So lots of fine novels and stuff. Yeah, almost everybody who's not George Lucas that has written about that era is trying to sort of fix it. Like, I haven't watched the Clone Wars CG series, but I hear that they, like, try to make Anakin and Obi-Wan's relationship and motivations in Episode 3 make a lot more sense, which is cool. Yeah, so. well, I, then I there's like the Clone Wars absolutely revolutionary Gandhi Tartakovsky animated. I love those. Yeah, I love anything Gandhi Tartakovsky like has ever done. Like Samurai Jack, but with Jedi. It Which was, is coming back, by yeah, the way. Staggeringly brilliant. Yeah. Staggeringly brilliant. Yeah. So yeah, to be honest with you, I would say that, that that is my verdict on the prequels. I mean, the very defini definition of mediocrity when we talk about the source materials, the movies... Mm -hmm. But what it spawned and what it did for the Star Wars universe outside of the films, uh, yeah, I don't have many complaints. All the books I've read are great. The games I've played are great. So really what we're saying is thank you, George Lucas, for making the prequels. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> keeping Star Wars. You know, know what? what I would thank say that. you for keeping Star Wars alive. Yeah, thank you no. for allowing the EU to exist. Thank you for licensing off the property. Yeah, thank you absolutely. for thank you for being a great idea man who surrounds himself with people like, you know, Kathleen Kennedy, and if you go back further, John Williams, Ralph McQuarrie, oh, yeah. uh, Irvin Kirshner, who can take your big ideas and turn them into really interesting human stories. Speaking yeah. of really interesting yeah. human stories, Brianna, what do you think is the point 
of Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> <laughs> He's a duck with long ears. <laughs> that if I was a child, I would have loved him. But as an adult... Well, I was no. 11, I was, I think I was 11, 10 or 11 when episode one came out and I already hated Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> I so. didn't hate him as a child. I actually, when people came out with such vitriol, I was like, what's wrong with it? And then I watched it again. I was like, okay, yeah, he's kind of, I was going to say something super mean. <laughs> he's he's I, kind I, of annoying, but. I think that Red Letter Media's description of him as a funny cartoon rabbit is pretty accurate. <laughs> Like, he doesn't fit the tone of the Star Wars universe at all. Oh, he's the most out-of-place character the, in the entire seven movies by far. Yeah. Like, well, and I mean, we're, we're not quite to the part where we're talking about Episode Seven yet, but it's a prime example of how to do humor in the Star Wars universe correctly and how to do it incorrectly. Incorrectly is the Jar Jar Binks zany <laughs> cartoon way, and correctly it's to just have characters who are funny people that say funny things so yeah i got jar jar confused a lot with that big flat fat blob thing what's that thing? boss nass whatever like the, the guy who made the leia job of the hut oh, job of the hut <laughs> well that's so, an interesting Jabba, theory Jabba's just jar jar Binks turned into a hut jar jar later. really <laughs> let himself go <laughs> became job well, of the hut all well, those characters i did not like so I, they i got associated with I don't care about you guys. <laughs> so I've got those I also confused. speak Hadith. Oh, Jawa no no bleaky wookie moody rao. Oh, oh, don't ever do that again, please. <laughs> oh, I remember. So when we were watching the movies, we actually had a really long discussion about Jabba the Hutt's accent. Whether he had one and whether yeah. it was like a Sopranos sort of like uh, mobster accent or whether we're talking something. <laughs> Oh yeah, if Even yeah, more. if his accent is like the Brooklyn gangsta accent of of Hut World, but then most Huts are gangsters, so pretty like, much, yeah. Their so, whole government is kind of run by the mob, so it it just yeah. kind of turns his character all over the place. <laughs> New depths of Jabba the Hut. <laughs> I I don't want to see any depths of Jabba the Hut. <laughs> the surface is bad enough. I don't want to think about the depths. Nope. So how about you guys? Did you, As you guys were watching it, did you notice... I mean, we discussed the intricate political situation of the prequels <laughs> ad nauseum in order to keep ourselves entertained. But uh, watching them again, did anything new strike you? Prequels or originals? I think, I think it was, this was only the second time that I had watched all six movies in chronological order, like, in a short period of time. Um, and... I think I was I was further struck by how fake everything in the prequels looks because almost all the sets are CG. Like in in the originals, you kind of feel like you're there, and in the prequels, it's like, oh yeah, I'm watching a sci-fi movie right now. I guess I feel the opposite on that. Really? Yeah. Cause, well, because I, I could just I could tell it was fake. Like I could tell that the creatures were fake, I, and I the agree with scenery you. was fake, especially in Phantom Menace, yeah. where the CG frankly wasn't up to the ambition of the film. Yeah, like it was it was extremely painfully noticeable. And then Revenge of the Sith was better. And then going back to Seven, where they've gone back to having practical sets and practical effects, it's like this feels way more like Star Wars than the prequels. It feels did. organic. Yeah. Feels real. Yeah. So, because you can actually still go to the sets in Tunisia. You know what? It's funny that we're talking about this, and Episode Seven keeps coming up. I would love to ask J.J. Abrams and his team. It's like, how much did you study the prequels? Is like, let's learn from where these failed. Frankly, let's borrow the few things where it succeeded. Mm -hmm. Let's learn where they failed, because so much of the decisions that were made in Force Awakens actually felt like rejections. I think that was absolutely. A factor. Yeah, yeah, Attack of the Clones, and they were all the right decisions. I mean, the the prequels had manifold weaknesses that I'm glad that the new movies are jettisoning. I I, I mean, I, I admire the guy tremendously, but Lucas wasn't up to the task. His scripts were subpar, and that's all there is to it. He He did an admirable job of salvaging something through his special effect wizardry and his other talents. And, of course, the team he surrounds himself with and the massive budgets he was able to bring to bear with the might of the intellectual property. But it all comes back. I mean, we just watched a video today, TJ, when we were doing some of our own yeah. work. It all comes back to the fact that the screenplays are diseased. They're awful. And 
It's very, very hard. I could name them. I could name a hundred movies off the top of my head. It is very, very hard to save a bad script, mm-hmm. even if everything else is right and the actors bring a hundred percent. And if, if the script is diseased, you're, you're probably not going to end up with a good movie. And the prequels yeah. were not good movies. Yeah, uh, I think it comes down to the script. No, yeah, I absolutely agree. I agree. Yeah, and the script for I think one of the things transitioning to episode seven that I thought was masterfully done about. Or not episode seven. Transitioning to the new... What episode is it? It's seven. It is? The new one is seven, yes. Four, five, six. Yeah, I can't count. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You can use your fingers if, if you're having a hard time. No. Okay. Then it's confusing. Because <laughs> I end up with two you fingers on stop. one You hand might want to stop <laughs> talking about counting with your fingers being confusing. <laughs> episode one has, ev- episode one has to be the middle finger. Obviously. She has the dumb. <laughs> I have other smarts. But no, one of the things that I thought was masterful about the script for episode seven was the fact that there was, it was actually pretty sparse on dialogue. A lot of stuff happened and they did a lot of, they did a lot of character development and they did a lot of exposition of worlds and of what's happened since then without people having to say stuff. It goes back, I think, to what was really the strength of the Empire Strikes Back, which is, by the way, possibly one of the three or four finest sci-fi movies ever made, like upon re-watching it. Yeah. Good Lord, Empire was a good film. And it was a thin film as far as spoken exposition. And there, there were a lot of moments that rode by just on their tension and on their action and on a couple lines. It was still heavier on the dialogue, though, than Episode 7. Episode 7 was really very light on dialogue. But everything that was there had a had a had a purpose. Told us something. Yeah, that was a screenplay that was workshopped a lot. You can tell. What did we all think of it? I I I loved it. But I'll let you guys. No, talk I first. I loved it too. I I absolutely loved it. Finest I think film it's, in the Star Wars series, apart from Empire. I I'm kind of. I think it is. I liked it better than Return of the Jedi. I'm not sure on New Hope. I'm going to need to wait for some time to go past. I think New Hope was obviously more iconic, but I enjoyed TFA more. Yeah, no, I think it I think it was excellent. I think the characters are excellent. I think the story is excellent. I think the sets are excellent. The script is excellent. Did I I might have said script twice. <laughs> if it if I did, it's because that's my favorite part of the movie. Can but. you guys think of any movie that was so relieving and just it was there was so much joy to have it proved to be so I, yeah, good? No, I was just happy God. to be like we're back in the era where Star Wars is amazing and not Everybody's bitching about the prequels. You could somewhat justifiably, hear, but yeah. you could almost hear like an audible sigh of relief go up in the theaters when yeah. the credits yeah. start rolling, and everyone is really laughing and getting into it. Yeah, like yeah. yes, it's definitely the funniest uh, yeah. Star Wars movie. Like the character dialogue is just it's it's witty, it's witty and, and it's sharp. Finn it's is a riot. Yeah. Finn is a riot. Yeah, yeah. No. hilarious it's, character. It's very it's it's modern. Uh, character dialogue writing, which is slightly clashes with the tone of the original trilogy, but I think it works in bringing Star Wars into the modern era while still keeping the parts of it that are important. That was actually the thing that I found so compelling about it, because I don't think any other franchise has spanned generations quite like this. Yeah. Um, Star Trek was... I mean, essentially, they just took all the old characters that everybody knows and loves... And they diverted them onto a new timeline, but they're still exactly the same characters, and they're going to do new adventures in the same timeline. Um, they're characters that were designed in the 50s, 6, 70s. Um, yeah. And then the same thing for all the Marvel the Marvel heroes. We have heroes that were designed in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And have been and, rebooted a million times. Star Wars yeah. hasn't been rebooted. Well, and I say, I say that loving the Marvel movies. I really like what Marvel's doing with them. Um, and I adored Guardians of the Galaxy, and yes. I'm oh, yeah. super excited for the movies this summer. But what Star Wars did was like take all of the old, all of the stuff that was awesome about the old movie, all of the characters that everybody loved, and the characters are old, and they're not going to be in this new world that's happening. It passed the baton onto a new generation mm-hmm. of fans. It passed the baton onto a new generation of heroes. And the stories are going to be different, but they're going to be different connected to the past. I don't know. It was 
it, it left me feeling tingly. It was just really, really cool. I agree with you about the torch passing. It, it just is the, the old characters that we know and love had their moments to be certain and are important parts of the plot. But it is very clear, in my opinion, from TFA that this is not a story about them. I mean, Luke will obviously factor in his way, and Leia will factor in his way, and her, her way. Her way. <laughs> we're not that progressive. <laughs> no, we're not that progressive. That was a mistake. Um, in her way, but this is not their story, and I thought that that was brave yeah. and executed very well. Yeah. My only beef with the newer movie, Episode Seven, um, I did not like the script for Leia. I felt there was too much screen time of her looking at the camera. And I felt like her her script could have been more involved and more not um I, I, predictable. I, I did get the sense that of everyone there, Carrie Fisher was the one that was like the least having a good time. Yeah, that's what I felt too. Like I felt that through the movie. She like she she didn't really seem that excited to be back yeah, in I Star Wars. I didn't feel a lot of joy from her in Which, her performance. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. I, I have a slightly different perspective on that, and that is that I I feel like her character, especially after watching the the episode seven Leia right after watching all of the original movies Mm -hmm. um, and how dynamic she was and how um, forward thinking she was and how take charge she was. What I saw in episode seven was um, a parent who felt like she had largely failed and a general who was not winning the battle that she was trying to fight like she's been fighting this war for the last 30 years yeah um and it's they're still in from what i can tell exactly the same place that they were in in the original stories so it was actually really interesting for me because her her character may be in the same character that a lot of people from that generation are now especially with the economic downturn especially with sort of looking at kids who keep not being able to quite launch right because the economy is yeah. stuck there's just this this generational sense of oh what did i do wrong and i'm tired and i'm i'm stuck in this job and these decisions so i i don't know i thought it was i thought it was poignant it was not happy yeah i think it's um, also it, important it, to it, it felt real to me the biggest failure in my opinion of the force awakens is to lay the foundation for what's going on I think it's important to probably, I don't know if people listening to this know, but I'll just take 60 seconds to fire this out here. What's going on after the Battle of the em- of Endor is the Empire fragmented. It became a, a mad power struggle with moths and nation states seizing star systems and the First Order obviously being one of these. The Resistance, in case anybody didn't get this, is not the Republic and it's not the Rebel Alliance. It is a proxy militia secretly being funded by the Republic that Leia right. has ostensibly volunteered to guide. Because the Republic yeah. technically signed a peace treaty with the Imperial with the Remnant. First Order, yep. But then Leia was like, no, screw that. I'm starting this underground military mm-hmm. junta, to not put it lightly. And But uh, still, again, she's still fighting the same battle, yeah. essentially, that she was fighting in her 20s. And she hasn't really established anything. Well, it's, it's a pervasive theme of Star Wars, and one that I'm glad that no real element of Star Wars fiction shies away from, that the dark side can't be beaten. There, there is no triumph of the light in this universe. You can't get rid of it. It'll always be there. Well, and I, I think we have to insert the spoiler warning right now, uh, because I, I do want to discuss one of my problems with the movie which is that jj basically was like i don't want to have the republic (laughs) like i don't want to have you know i don't want to have the victory of the rebellion lead to a stable government i want to have rebels versus empire again so he basically breaks the republic up into this military wing and this political wing and then like the actual political structure of the republic just gets blown up. So it's like, oh okay, now we're back to where we well, were at the beginning. We of the don't movie. actually know what damage We don't results. yeah, we don't know what is um, left of it. I thought it was <laughs> more prominently implied that they were just badly damaged. 
But I think it would have been it would have been more interesting to have the Republic as a a political entity in being. And see, I think then what you get into is the whole problem that they came up with on Naboo with the stupid trade federation. They're like, why is this a problem? And well, how is this a you thing? Can, it was a problem a because Naboo is... Queen, a, why? Well, it's, it's basically this. It's a problem in the prequels because Naboo is an insignificant backwater world that will never be important to the plot well, of Star no, but, Wars. But my point, my point is, what they chose to do in Episode 7 was focus on character development and yeah. plot development. The con- and it's they true. didn't focus on the political side, and I, I like that. The conflict between the First Order and the Resistance is actually a shockingly small part of the actual story. It's it's really yeah. more a story of characters, and it might con- that might continue to happen. I mean... And I, th- I think if you look at it, if you look at the originals, that's actually how the originals are structured, too. I mean, there's a little more exposition, largely because it's a lot simpler. Yeah. I mean, there's the... Vader and his forces, and there's the rebellion, and that's it. Well, yeah, you can tell there are going to be some parallels, like just like the original Star Wars trilogy was, you know, a story driven by Luke, Leia, and Han, but was a story about Vader. So too is very obviously the new trilogy going to be a story driven by Finn and Rey that is mostly about Kylo Ren. I think that the parallels are very yeah. strong. In that way, and that's not a bad thing. So, where, uh, what do you guys think about the parallels? I know a lot of people are complaining that it's too much like the original, like A New Hope. Well, it's just here's here's a fear that I've heard expressed that I kind of I, I have a different perspective on it. It's like, oh, it's just going to be exactly like the original trilogy. This one is A New Hope, and the next one will be like Empire, and the one after that will be like Return of the Jedi. I think that The Force Awakens is meant to parallel the original trilogy and get us back to a point of familiarity because I could break that movie into acts and say, this is New Hope, this is Empire Strikes Back, this is Return of the Jedi almost. I actually agree with that. So I think that, and based on what we've heard about the script for the new one and and what people who have read it have been saying about it, it's going to go off and do something completely way different than what we've ever seen before. Mm. We see a yeah. major actual break with the prequels and um, uh, the original trilogy in that uh, The Force Awakens, spoiler alert, ends with a decisive and significant triumph for the good yeah. guys. Not we're, a minor, we're in spoiler but, territory, yeah. by the way. You should just turn this off by now if you don't want spoilers. And if you haven't seen the movie <laughs> by the time this podcast hits, yeah. I almost don't feel bad that you're being spoiled. Like, <laughs> we're weeks into it by I now. I do feel bad Get off your butt and go see it and stop there, listening awesome. to it. I, I agree that it's kind of dumb that they had another Death Star and they had to send in X-Wings to blow up another Death Star. I would not have made that decision myself as a writer. That is one of the criticisms of the movie that I agree with. I agree with with that. Um, Or at least have it do something different. Like, don't don't make it a thing that blows up planets and don't make them have to fly X-Wings to destroy it. Like, maybe they could have captured it or something at like do do something a little bit different than another planet destroying space station that has to be blown up with x-wings that that said yeah <laughs> the finale was not i mean it that was a byproduct the star yeah. killer was the in the original new hope destroying the death star was the final mission what happened there was way more about what happened between finn ray and kylo ren than yeah. the star killer yeah like it, it's just another example and and again i will say this the the triumph that we end TFA on is is total, which is actually a thematic break from the other trilogy. That's true. We don't know what's left of either side by the end yeah. of the no. so And can... it's Kylo Ren, the right-hand man and the avatar of the bad guy, gets his ass handed to him. Yeah. It, that, it, it, call it what which, it is. The bad which, guys get routed. That, which I, I do have to say something about that. I thought, found it very odd that Ray and Finn could take pick up a lightsaber and be just as good as well, him. Well, the choreography yeah. could have done a better job of showing yeah. that he lost because of his wounds. Well, here, yeah. here's here's the thing. And here, if watching it a second time, here's kind of what I saw with that. I do think that's that's still sort of a valid criticism. But um, Kylo is not well trained. They make him out to be this, you know, he's the Sith Lord, he's the new Darth Vader, but he's really not. He's like a punk kid. He's like, yeah, especially since he's not in control of anything. He's talented with the Force. Snoke is propping him up. Like it's like your 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 boss's punk nephew who gets like made VP of the company and he thinks he's all hot shit, but he like he's master of the Knights of Ren, but he's probably not even on the level that like Obi Wan was in Episode One. 
is what it seems well, like to well, me. Yeah. You look at his combat style, they very intentionally yeah. made him raw as hell. He's more talented yeah. in the Force than so, he's a swordsman. Point two, he, he does get shot with a bowcaster by Chewbacca, which they've been building up and making a big deal the whole movie of, oh yeah, that thing really packs a punch. Like, they show it knocking Han a stormtrooper yeah. like 30 meters. And furthermore, he is actually fighting a trained stormtrooper who's literally been, like, bred to be a killer right. machine. Right, and, so. and, and he, he destroys Finn for the most part. Like, Finn gets one good shot in on him, but Finn is losing that entire fight. Yeah. Like, right up to the point that he gets knocked And out. by the time Ray gets to him, he's had his arm cut open and he's been bleeding all over the snow. Which, However, as Ray a guy is who, the prodigy. As That's a guy who has boxed with bruised ribs, it's hard. Like, which I, I'm fine with him being deeply handicapped in that fight. Which, which, which brings me to Ray's abilities, which is the criticism of Force Awakens that I most agree with, but with an asterisk. And so this this will take a second to explain. Yes, I agree that it's kind of ridiculous that she's so good with lightsaber and she hasn't ever used one before. She doesn't have Jedi training and she can just somehow mind trick people out of nowhere. At least she doesn't have Jedi training that we know of. Which, I love the fact that she mind-tricked James Bond, by yeah. the way. Just gonna say that. Was that Daniel Craig? Yes, that I knew Daniel he was Craig. in the movie, but I didn't know that was him. Yep. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, that makes sense, huh? Okay. Yeah, so, but the asterisk is, the movie is called The Force Awakens. We don't know what that means yet. So if they explain in the later movies in a way that, you know, doesn't seem weird that this is why she was able to do all this amazing stuff with so little training, I will definitely be willing to let it slide. So I'm not going to get bent out of shape about that and until I, I, I see the later movies. And as, as a guy who has <laughs> fought injured myself, yeah. I am fine with Kylo Ren ultimately losing after he's been friggin' shot. Like, I'm, Well, I'm yeah, at that point, that. he's been wounded by Chewbacca. He's been wounded by, by Finn. Finn. He hates Rey for some reason. Well, he does the force choke thing where he's like, what girl? So apparently he probably knows who she is. He probably doesn't like her. And I also get the yeah. sense that or he's, he's just an insecure like teenage no. boy and is and like, wait, there's a girl her. that can and, beat me. And as, and as a guy who's like, I, I've, I've done a lot of stage combat and choreography there in myself. Um, I think it's implied in the first several phrases of that fight that he's he's sparing her. He's supposed to take her prisoner. Snoke wants her. That's true. He's that's he is another very, good point. He is very very clearly holding back in the first several phrases of the fight. Because he can't kill her. Because he can't kill her. And all the while, it, it shows in several fr frames, he's bleeding all over the snow, and she's getting hers. And when the time comes where he realizes, oh shit, I'm in a fight to the death, he can't resist his opponent anymore. Which, believe it or not, happens all the time in combat sports. The old veteran tries to take the young pup into deep water, only to find that when he gets to the later rounds, he has less left than the young guy. It happens all the time. It just I, That's how I interpreted the choreography. It's We see Kylo Ren winning most of the combat, trying to keep her alive, trying to take her prisoner. A couple of sword strokes are designed to disarm. And then when he starts saying, like, I need to teach you, blah, 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 well, uh, he's realizing now that he's in a fight and he can't actually conjure the stuff to beat her. And then she, she hands it to him. And I actually kind of liked that. I thought that was pretty powerful. And a good demonstration of the dark side arrogance that we see get the better of Sith all throughout Star Wars in the EU. Yeah. Like, so often great Sith characters lose fights they shouldn't because they're just very full of themselves. And getting shot with a bowcaster doesn't hurt, I say again. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Chewbacca. <laughs> all right, so, the, I mean, I think the biggest question that everybody keeps coming away with although it's it's funny to me that everybody online seems to have made up their own mind as to the answer of this question who is Ray's family she is Luke Skywalker's daughter no I'm staking my life on that I think that that is I will eat a lightsaber I think that that is probably most likely I do not think that is the strongest here here is yeah, here is my here is my evidence so for... you changed you were originally no be once no, no, he's always no I was no, always, that's my I was always a I, think, I think she's. So a here's movie. here's my evidence for the Skywalker theory. Number one, they they said that they very specifically were not telling you her last name in the first. Okay, that's not movie. evidence for Skywalker. <laughs> so, but <laughs> that's, it, it's, it's evidence, evidence that her last name is important. It yeah, supports multiple important. theories. Absolutely. So, 
if we're if we're going based on the fact that J.J. Abrams probably doesn't care about the prequels, there's a very limited number of of names it could be. Could be Skywalker, could be Solo, could be Kenobi. Or Yoda's uh, daughter, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually Jar Jar Binks' daughter. I mean, but outside of those three, it's really I mean, those three, I, agree. It, I mean, what else would it, I mean, she is she related? Like, is it Antilles? Is she a Palpatine? Is she? I think it really has to be Solo, Skywalker, or Kenobi. Those are the only real possibilities. I would agree. Um, she looks like. She could be Natalie Portman's sister. Yeah. I think that's a huge evidence in favor of that she is a Skywalker. But Natalie Portman has, like, the quintessential pretty girl face. That Just is what, like, look pretty at, young but girls look at look them like. side by side, down to, in like, the how movies. their hair okay. is done. Okay, like, so as adjudicator, I will say that is evidence. It is extremely weak evidence. <laughs> it's my you. I consider that. that to be strong evidence. And, um,. The whole thing with you know Luke's lightsaber calling out to her, which I I I will grant that might be a red herring, but I think that she is going to be Luke's daughter. Especially since that is not Luke's lightsaber; that is actually originally Vader's lightsaber that was held. By yeah, Kenobi but it was, Luke's and it, most it was Luke's most training lightsaber. Well, and, yeah, I also don't know that I like yeah. that lightsabers are suddenly force artifacts. But that's, I, that's I wasn't a mind. huge I fan of that. I wasn't a huge fan of that either. But I'm not too you bothered know, by it. I will say this: I think that her being a Skywalker is the most likely theory I've heard. I think it is a weak writing decision. Yeah, I, agree. I don't think it. I don't. I, I would. I would. In order to not be disappointed it's less by that than reveal, a solo. Yeah, in order to be disappointed by that, re- not to be disappointed by that reveal, though, I would need ample script justification for that happening to Luke. Basically, him knocking somebody up and See, leaving. I don't Ray think, on and I've had, I have had this argument for paragraphs on online already, not with you, but with other people. I don't think it's at all weird for Luke Skywalker to have a kid because. You know, who forbade Jedi from having relationships? Well, it was the Jedi Council pre-Order 66. Um, We are now rebuilding the Order from one person who has only had two contact with two other Jedi. He only had contact with any other Jedi, period, for about five years of his life. Never was fully trained. Yoda, you know, specified he never completed his training. And he's going to have his own ideas. But in... Epi- but in Not to in- mention the fact that that the Jedi before Order 66 pretty much failed. So even if he did know all of the ins and outs of their doctrine, he might want to change some things. I would be, like I'm saying, in order to not be disappointed, I need Episodes 8 or whenever the reveal occurs script to justify it to me. Yeah. And that is part of what they would need to do. <laughs> Especially given what they built him up to in Episode 6, because by the time he's he's confronting Jabba the Hutt, and by the time he's doing all that leadership stuff, he's uh-huh. like Zen Master just total almost monkish yeah like he's absolutely devoted he he loves leia but he, all of his emotions all of his like passion is kind of subdued and he's focused it but, up into some into devotion to the force but here's and, here's the coup de grace the old jedi order believed attachment was the path to the dark side and for anakin that was true originally but it yeah. was Anakin's attachment to Luke that led him to destroy the Emperor and bring balance to the Force. Therefore, the new Jedi might not have such a negative view of attachment. I would, I would need, and, but again, leaving, I would need, I would need. We this, need to give a second because yeah. everybody's mind was just blown, Dylan. The, just give, give him, give him the, a minute. Give him a minute. The script, the script of the following movies <laughs> needs to justify it. I, Luke is canonically put put up as like a a Jedi worshiper, basically a holocron head. I would need the script to tell me. No, he actually really doesn't agree with a lot of the old Jedi. Like, I need, I need it, I need it. Whereas, see, I, think I, we'll get I would, it. I would much rather see her be a Kenobi, largely just because that gives it that diverges further from the like it's a shift. It's a good well, shift. Here's it's a the good thing, shift though, and canon gives us canon. a lot of possible mothers. It does, but I think that's a poorer decision because you have to explain this whole convoluted like. Obi Wan Kenobi had a relationship with this character who you never saw, who then had a kid, 
who then had that. a relationship spent, like, a, a kid who you never saw on Tatooine by himself and, thinking the Jedi were dead who and married this third ex- character you never saw that and then they that. had a daughter named Rey you like, never have to explain <laughs> that anyways if it is Luke's daughter anyways yeah and no. you need to and Luke's it's either you gotta make a decision either her mother or depending on who the important parent is Either the other parent is insignificant or they aren't. I mean And here's here's my other thing. He Luke has to abandon his daughter for some reason. Well, and I think that, that reason would be obvious if it's if she's a Skywalker, Kylo Ren, and Snoke when he massacres. So he abandoned his daughter when Kylo Ren was five and still his apprentice? No, no. Yes. Kylo Ren is they're older than Ren. They're but not. They're about the same they're age. Not. No, they because oh, really? she yeah, they're she not. she was a little kid when he went crazy and killed everybody. When yeah. he, he Kylo Ren is in his late twenties, and he yeah. in his late teens is when he I think is implied I, that he. <laughs> I'm gonna need to Wikipedia this. I, yeah, yeah, me too. That's actually let's so, clear this up because I think I think they're more similar in age. They're not. What do you guys think about in her flashback? Um, the voice that was talking to her, one of the yeah, the voice that talks was to her, Obi Wan for sure. It's Kenobi. That's the only voice. Yeah, that's her name. That's Kenobi. Ewan McGregor. So um, that it's, it's it is Ewan confirmed McGregor to be and, Ewan McGregor. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you guys feel about that? I, that was my original reason for thinking that it was actually Obi Wan Kenobi. That is her. It's either uh, a cool cameo or it's significant. It's, great, yeah. it's either a cool cameo or it's significant. Kylo Ren was born. One year after the Battle of Endor, it's highly implied, apparently, that he was conceived in the celebration after the Battle of Endor. <laughs> he is older funny. than Rey. So he's, yes, yeah, so he's, he's like Rey. 29, and Rey is in her, probably in her late teens. Yeah, like 18, yeah. 19 years yeah. old. Because um, he, okay, so here we go. He sent to study alongside other Jedi students at a young age, being instructed and led by his uncle, Luke Skywalker. Um he betrayed and destroyed his former Jedi peers. Um, I think it's implied that, especially that scene where we see Kylo Ren in the rain with mm-hmm. First Order shock troopers, I think it's implied that he kills his fellow yeah, students. So Ky- yeah, oh, Kylo, Kylo is 10 years older so, than Rey. So whether, Rey is 19 at the beginning yeah. and Kylo is 29. Whether, yeah. whether Rey is a Skywalker or Kenobi or whatever, I think leaving her on Jakku post- Kylo Ren betraying and killing everybody well, is makes sense. And I think Lor Senteca, the old guy at the beginning, was like her Obi-Wan. He was supposed to watch out for her and he was supposed to give her the map piece, you know, if when Luke she was ready. ever contacted him or if she met some goal where she needs to come find him now. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, it'll be it'll be interesting. I'm really excited to see what happens. And regardless of who her parents are, I'm super excited for what they did with her character because I think it was just masterful. And let me recommend Aftermath to Star Wars fans. It's it's a great book and I'm super glad I read it before I saw TFA. Like, wonderful foundational information. Yeah. So I, I recommend it. Awesome. Well, we love the movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. If you have seen it, go see it again. <laughs> Um, you'll you'll catch the stuff you've missed for sure. <laughs> I still I think it would be hilarious if we could get Star Wars to be Gone with the Wind, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was looking it up, adjusted for inflation, Gone with the Wind is still the best, the highest grossing movie ever by actually a lot. Uh, Star Wars, the original one, is actually second. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Adjusted for inflation. Interesting. So yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I think Gone with the Wind came out when there was a lot less to do. <laughs> <laughs> Gone with the Wind is a great movie. Uh, Gone with the Wind is a fantastic movie. But it's not Star Wars. It is not Star Wars. <laughs> it is not Star Wars. Uh, but, so before we before we go, let's do a little bit of year-end reviews. We have a lot of year-end reviews on our blog, if you guys want to check that out. Loresworn.com, you can check out all of our reviews. We have a bunch of them. Plug, 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 plug. <laughs> so... For you guys who were doing a lot of gaming this year, what was your favorite moment in gaming? I didn't do a lot of gaming this year, unfortunately. Um, well, I mean, when you weren't in law school. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't. This year, I actually, I, I think of all the years I can remember caring about video games was the year where my time was the most consumed by other things, and I did not get to... Like, I, I keep a list on my phone and formerly kept a list in, on my computer and then before that on paper even of what I wanted to get to this year. Uh-huh. And this is the only list since I started keeping those lists 10 years ago where what I didn't get to numbered in the double digits that I wanted to get to. So, and you can probably tell by my, my, my contributions to our year-end lists 
my experience of the year was frankly incomplete. I haven't even finished Telltale's Game of Thrones yet. Well, mine was arguably more incomplete. I didn't play Witcher three. Yeah, I, I, I got like to everybody. The, I got to the year. major title that you did not get. Okay, to Okay, but, but the question still is: in spite of the fact that you guys didn't get to three quarters of your list, what was your favorite moment? The in final, final the stop final prequeling, game. Dylan. Jeez. The final, the final ten hours of Witcher three. Yeah, the final ten hours of Witcher three that made me stay up way later than I should have during a final studying period to finish it are. Taken as a chapter, it's not an act as a generous term, but taken as a chapter of gameplay story, um, probably one of the top ten most powerful things I've experienced with a controller in my hand ever. I cried. Um, Not ashamed to admit it. Brilliant writing um, alongside probably the best RPG gameplay to come along in 2015. And um, an ending that I loved was just so true to the themes of the story and so true to the journey of the character and the characters involved. I was just filled with so much satisfaction and yeah, the, uh, the, the final chapter of the Witcher three's main campaign was, and, and yeah, far and away second place wouldn't even come close. I just think it's weird that Geralt moved to Brooklyn and opened a gyro shop. That just <laughs> struck me as a bizarre uh, ending for his character. I mean, uh, he uh, he thought about becoming a taxi yeah, cab driver, yeah, but uh, ultimately <laughs> went another direction. And I thought that was <laughs> that was true <laughs> to his internal journey. How about you, TJ? <laughs> um, well, my I guess my favorite moment and also my game of the year is just the entire experience of Soma, which is the new game from the guys that made Amnesia: The Dark Descent, and it's it's. Like, in in our Game of the Year article, I called it, you know, it's a horror experience on par with any, you know, film or, um, you know, any anything in the genre that you could hold up next to it. It's a very smart game. It's probably not as scary in, in terms of, like, you know, monsters are coming to get me as, as Amnesia was, but it's, it's thought-provoking atmospheric the environments are amazing the writing is amazing the voice acting is great and uh yeah it'll make you think in in like a blade runner isaac asimov sort of way that is a 2015 game i literally cannot wait to play that yeah. is that is that tops my list of games i didn't get to this year much yeah. in the same way i think with each three. other's with our our respective game of the years were like switched around were the number one game that the other person wished they had been able to get to. So. Yeah, I, I <laughs> Amnesia was genius. Um, Machine for Pigs did some really creative things. Yeah, I've heard that Soma is it's the cherry on top of that Sunday. It's, frankly, it's, it's definitely so an evolution of the uh, Amnesia uh, formula. Some Amnesia, of the smartest writing in gaming. Amnesia felt like a, an indie game in some of the the mechanics and and some aspects of the interface soma doesn't feel like an indie game at all it feels like a, a polished you know release from a triple a studio i've seen some i've seen some gameplay videos and stuff yeah. on steam and whatnot and it it strikes me as all the best from the revolutionary system shock too but with that that classic amnesia flair and that genius writing. It's this is this if System Shock Two is is like the benchmark. This is Soma's like System Shock Two with a grad degree. <laughs> System Shock Two. It's I would a call. lot smarter than than System. It's the not grandfather that System, of those type of games. Not that System Shock Two was not intelligent in its writing, but Soma is like a grown up version of System Shock Two. That's what I've heard. Yeah, I've heard. It's, so looking ahead to 2016, if you guys could pick a studio to be a fly on the wall as they're like putting out their stuff and developing the games, what are you guys excited about? What do you wish you could work on? Up to Edmonton, man. I want to find out what's going on with the Mass Effect series. Yeah, I'm, I, I was conflicted about this because I made Mass Effect Andromeda was my number two most anticipated game, and we just learned like between when the article came out and when we recorded this, that the director of the game left with like less than a year of production to go, which has me a little bit worried. Um, and it makes me wonder why he left, like truly, yeah. not that condensed PR 
it hasn't reason. it hasn't made me a lot worried just because in my opinion, there has not been a subpar Bioware game since Dragon Age 2, and there hasn't been a subpar Mass Effect game ever. Right. So they they still they still have by benefit of the doubt the the Mass Effect team does at least, but it is a little bit concerning um, because Bioware has been known to make missteps here and there, um, whether it be Dragon Age 2's case where a lot of things went wrong, or you know. Mass Effect 2 and 3, you can point to some smaller things that went wrong, um, even though they were both excellent games uh, looked at as a whole. But more one, uh, my curiosity with Mass Effect more stems on where they're taking the series. Mass Effect and Commander Shepard are almost symbiotically tied. Like, yeah. the original three Mass Effect games are the story of, I want to say, possibly the most iconic PC in history. Like Commander Shepard, yeah, player um, character for those of you <laughs> yeah, not personal role player, and and, it, yeah. it, and I use it as a an RPG term, yeah. And that journey defined the Mass Effect trilogy. Mm-hmm. Your journey as your Commander Shepard, the direction they are taking a new. I don't know if it's going to be a trilogy or not. A new set of Mass Effect games. If the first one makes money, yeah. it'll be a trilogy, <laughs> and it will make money. Yeah. Um, a new set of Mass Effect games that aren't just not about Commander Shepard, but are liberated from his situation entirely. I think that's risky. I think that it could possibly pay off huge. I'm skeptical. Not a bad skeptical. It's still my most anticipated game of 2016. It's still a midnight release game for me. I'll probably binge it to beating it. But I'm interested to see what the talented writers and developers at Bioware can do to liberate a series from its foundational pillar. I can't really remember yeah. a game that has tried to do that before. Because the, the essence of Mass Effect was, you know, those first moments on the Normandy where you become Commander Shepard. Like, that carried the trilogy through straight to the end. The decisions you make yeah. and the people so, that survive under your command like, or don't. Yeah, the universe was great, but the fact that it was our, you know, story that started... When did... Mass Effect One come out two thousand six. I was n- I I want to say I wasn't in college yet. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were definitely in high school when that came out. So um, I just I've never I can't remember another franchise that has tried to liberate itself yeah. from its foundational element before, and that could either work. And if any team could do it, it's I, I would be if I had to pick a team to try that feat, it would be Bioware yeah. Obsidian most definitely. But um, I'm nervous for it. It could it could go wrong. It could go very wrong. That that's true. Yeah, for fly on the wall, that's definitely my answer. Even though it was only my number two, my number one and my number three are Stellaris, which is Paradox's space grand strategy game that is going to be amazing, and then Total War Warhammer. And both of those, I wouldn't really want to be a fly on the wall because they've already shown me enough where it's just like give it to me already. And as far as Stellaris <laughs> goes, need to know it's anymore. like if, if Vegas offered odds. On yeah. like which game comes out next year that is just most likely to be amazing, like that I'm not nervous about at all. It would probably be yeah. Stellaris. Pa- I'm I'm not scared. Pa- Paradox Development Studio is bar none my favorite group of people making video games today. I mean, Crusader Kings two and Europa Universalis four are my number one and two most played games on Steam. I have like six hundred something hours in Europa and. Just past 800 hours in Crusader Kings 2, so... Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Paradox has mastered the deep strategic sandbox game like Beethoven mastered music. I mean, yeah. that is that is their thing. They're incapable of doing a bad job the, on it. The only times that, that they ever put out something bad, it's because it's buggy, and then they fix it, so... Yeah, and I mean... Does, they haven't left a product in a bad state for the entire time that I've been... Does a studio you know, do a better job yeah. than Paradox of continuing to make an already good release that they've made better through expansions and patches, and they're incredibly attentive. Yeah. So, Solaris is going to be awesome. It's inevitable. Yeah. And Total War Warhammer, as far as that goes, it's it's fantasy Total War. I mean, yeah. come on, that <laughs> game! I, I that game is going. They would have to do a lot wrong to mess that up. Yeah. I'm psyched for it. Definitely. And on that note, I think we're just about out of time. Mm-hmm. Thanks, guys, so much for joining us. Um, if you have thoughts on Star Wars or your games of the year, let us know in the comments. 
Um, we'd love to hear from you. You can check out all of our reviews on loresworn.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lorsworn Order. You can follow TJ, who tweets prolifically. <laughs> yeah, I am probably the, the, the Twitter holic of the bunch. It's uh, <laughs> uh, at Asa TJ, which is A S A T J Alpha Sierra Alpha Tango Juliet. <laughs> For those of you that <laughs> like the military phonetic For alphabet. Those of you that and you cannot <laughs> find me on social media while I'm off shaking my fist at a cloud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In today's news, young man fears change. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. It's okay. We tweet for him. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for listening, guys. Happy wait, New Year. <laughs> you what? We'll see you guys later. Hey, wait, what? <laughs>